So glad you could make it. Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Great guest in store for us, Tom Fumarello. Tom's a good friend, and he's got a lot of great things to offer us, whether it's shooting tips, uh, dog handling, or anything related to those two topics. And who knows, maybe the prospects for the Mets next year. All here on the Upland Nation podcast, as well as, uh, you know, a place to go hunting for free. Public access, one of my most important priorities these days. I'm there, you're there, we want to be there more. We're going to give you a place to go. Hunting strategy and dog handling tips, a trivia question, and a prize for one of you loyal listeners. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast right after this. Sage and Breaker Mercantile, you can find more information at Sage and Breaker, B R A K E R, dot com. They make the highest quality, I'll call it heirloom quality gun care and gun cleaning supplies. Don't forget to sign up for their newsletter. That's where you'll find out about all the brand new gear before everybody else. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. And then, hello, hello. If you're having trouble hearing me, it's because you're not protecting your ears when you go afield. Yeah, we all do it in the range, but ESPAmerica.com has enabled all of us to be able to afford high-quality hearing protection in the field as well. Learn more about their choices and why ESP is my choice. It's all at ESPAmerica.com. Welcome back. Tom Fiumarello joins us here on the Upland Nation podcast. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate being here. It's fun to talk with you again. We've been corresponding a lot by email. We got to spend just a little bit of time in the field last year in Kansas at that wonderful Fur Feathers Friends event that we put on. Appreciate your coming. And by the way, that uh, long-tailed Springer, I mean, Brittany of yours, oops, didn't mean to insult you like that. Um, that long-tailed dog of yours has got a cult following on my Facebook page already. <laughs> well, she's she's something kind of special. She's special to me, and uh, she's kind of like the little dog that could when uh, she was a year old when everybody said uh, she's a washout, and she's turned into being just a spectacular dog. Oh, absolutely. It was fun to watch her and and actually kind of special in the snow on that second day. So uh, all's well there, and I appreciate your coming out for that. All right. Um, so uh, among other things, I finally figured out why we get along so well. You were in the education business, and so was I. Um, you were in the human performance and sports psychology world. I was in the music performance and deviant psychology world, I guess. Okay. So uh, I understand now why you're you're a great teacher, and we're going to talk a lot about shooting and and how to become better shooters. Um, but over and above all of that stuff, what is it that uh, what is it that uh, that makes good shooters better? Can you nail it down to one thing? Um, it, it's physical ability, like anything else. Um, shooting is an eye-hand coordination sport, and the better your eye-hand coordination, the better you are. And, uh, you know, I work with a lot of kids, and kids have great eyes and great reflexes, great coordination, and that's what makes them better. Um, and, and that's what makes a, uh, an elderly shooter better, too. They've just had more experience, and they've honed those skills, and those skills are good. And we also see it in the reverse with, an older shooter, and all of a sudden the eyes get a little slower and the reflexes get a little slower, and where they could break a target, you know, today, you know, a year from now, they can't do that because they lose a few skills. But um, natural physical ability is, is really the crux of everything. All right, so if we're born whatever the opposite of an athlete is, if we're, if we're a born klutz, um, are there things we can practice? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we can develop um, we can develop the skills necessary to be a good wing shooter or to be a good clay target shooter. That's not a problem. Um, we're all born with those with those innate abilities, and if we hone those abilities, well, then we can become better. And like anything else, the more you do it, the better you'll become. Um, in line with that is 
Um, the more you do it under the eyes of a of a talented instructor who is going to be passionate about you, the better you're going to be also. So from that end, you know, you can spend 10 cases of flats or take a real quality lesson and have those 10 cases of flats, excuse me, instantaneously um, after a, a quality lesson. And, of course, a quality lesson starts with a quality instructor. Tom is uh, right up there. He teaches at St. Hubert's Club in New York, uh, but he's also certified by the Guild of Shooting Instructors at the United Kingdom. He's also part of the Paragon Center for Instructor Study, in senior instructor there. And uh, let's see what else. Yeah, You're also a level two instructor with the National Sporting Clays Association. So the guy, hey, everybody, this guy's got the credentials and he knows of what he speaks. If you'd like more information on Tom and his shooting instruction, go to Excel Sporting Clay Instruction. That's the letter X C E L Sporting Clay Instruction dot com. Tom, let's get back into that whole idea just a little bit because I'm, you know, I'm a student of studying shooting instruction because I'm so bad. And I've taken a lot of lessons and shot a lot of rounds. Is there one thing that all of us could be doing that we're not that would make us a better shooter? Well, the bottom line is get out there and shoot. Um, and wing shooting is totally different than clay target shooting. If you are a clay target shooter, and meaning sporting clays, trap, that kind of thing, um, wing shooting is totally different because it's a totally different game, and it's a totally different methodology in shooting. Um, not to say that you, if you're a good target shooter, you're not going to be a good wing shooter. That's not the case. But... Um, Really, they're two different aspects. So if you want to focus in on one or the other, um, we can kind of take that apart. And obviously on this show, it would be more wing shooting. Yeah, the problem is if we're going to practice, if we're going to shoot a 1,000 rounds to become a better wing shooter, we're never going to find a 1,000 birds that will cooperate with us in a day. Uh, so how do we, you know, how do we adapt uh, the clay target world to become a, a better wing shooter? Okay, so... Basically, it's focusing in on targets that emulate birds. Sporting clays was started in, in the 1800s, and that's what it was designed to do. It was, it was designed to emulate bird hunting. Well, that's kind of gone out the window, and we see sporting clay targets that don't look like any bird in any field in any world. <clears throat> but however, the skeet game is very similar to a lot of the birds that we shoot. And a lot of skeet is a little more instinctive. So a person who wants to become a better wing shooter, that skeet game is a really good, um, a really good tenor for increasing that wing shooting. So I would say if anybody would like to really become a better wing shooter, hone in on skeet, um, and especially some of the, some of the particular uh, stations on skeet. Um, low station two, high station two, um, low and high station um, four and five and six. They're all really good bird kind of hunting stations. So that would help you greatly. Yeah. Especially in skeet also. Skeet starts mostly from the low gun position, where in sporting clays and trap, a lot of people start from the high gun position. Well, in the bird world, you're never starting from the high gun position. You're always starting from the low gun position. So skeet kind of emulates that and would really help you in the field. I would only point out, and you would too, I'm sure, if you let, you know, if I'd let you, uh, that the the only fundamental difference is that uh, all those clay target games, the the targets come out of the thrower fast and they slow down, whereas a bird comes out slow off the ground and speeds up. But, you know, in the, in the distances we're shooting at in skeet, that's not much of an issue, is it? No, it's not. I mean, and that's one of the nice things with, with the skeet game. You know, if you're shooting over the peg, or even if you let it go a little longer and you're not in it for the skeet score, but you're in it for the bird hunting um, experience and the bird hunting, um, getting better at bird hunting, you can let it go a little longer, and, and you get a pretty true emulation of what a, what a game bird would do um, coming out of the grass, so especially on the low houses. So 
Um, yes, you're right. It does slow down rather than speed up, but boy, you sure can help your skills shooting that game. So when somebody comes to Tom Fumarello for a uh, lesson, uh, what is what what do most of them really want to accomplish if they had a goal? And I've filled out the forms at some of the lessons I've taken. My goal is to not embarrass myself in front of the dogs. But <laughs> what is the primary goal of most of the people who come to you to to learn how to be a better shooter, Tom? If they're if they're doing wing shooting, it's to take more game. Yeah. Um. Obviously, I mean that's the bottom line, and. You know, we we all have this innate ability. I used to say to most people that the American male, if you look on their birth certificate down low, it's signed by John Wayne and it's signed by Andy Oakley. Basically that if you're born an American male, you can put a shotgun in your hand and hit anything in the world. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. Um, but their goal is to take more game. So if you if you had to boil it down to the one thing that would help them take more game and you had 90 seconds to do that with a student, what would you make them do or suggest that they do? Well, here's the first thing. Don't ever look at anything that's on the shotgun <laughs> because that's going to line things up and that's going to cause awesome problems. As, as we say, this is an eye-hand coordination game. And looking at that target and trusting your brain to be the good computer that it is, and your hands to now um, do what that computer says, what you see is where that gun's going. And the worst problem we see in any shooter is they want to look back at that gun and line it up. And the second they do that, um, now the, the thing that they're trying to hit is not in the place where they last saw it. <laughs> and that becomes the problem. Aiming instead of pointing. That's correct. We aim. We we um. We don't aim a shotgun. That's for darn sure. You know, um, the, the that begs the question. Then how? I mean, if if we're just pointing at anything, and I and I've taken lessons from these guys, and I've watched a lot of them. You know, the the show shooters, and they'll shoot from between their legs or over their head or behind their back. You know, obviously, gun fit doesn't matter to them. How important is it to us? Well, it's it's got some importance in two reasons. One is that a gun that's a really poorly fitting gun will beat you up a little bit. Um, the recoil is going to be worse. It's not going to be in the right spot when you mount it. And when you look down it, the picture you get is not going to be correct. So in, in some respects... It does have its have its moments. However, in reality, um, when you see those guys doing what they're doing, all they're doing is looking at an object. And because they're looking at that object, their hands are now putting what they have, that implant in their hands, um, you know, uh, to the right spot. And it's no different than a hockey player that's, that's taking a shot across the middle. He's trying to match... Uh, the speed of that puck to the speed of his implement and put it in the right spot. But he's looking at that that thing coming across the middle, whether it be a hockey puck or a football or, or a basketball or it's whatever. He's not looking at his hands. He's not looking at the baseball glove. He's not looking at that hockey stick. He's looking at that whatever he's trying to hit. And this game is no different. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we've seen everything on TV. Um, from John Wayne movies to Wiley e. Coyote, and it's all point and shoot. Line it up, pull a trigger, and you're going to get what you get. And that's what our brain knows. So all of that cartoon watching is finally coming back to serve hey. us in some way. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, and when I give a lesson, I usually ask in the beginning, what do you do? And that is huge in the lesson um, as it goes on, because if they say, I'm a police officer. Well, I know everything they've done in their life is point and shoot. It's going to be a long day. If they tell me, oh, I've been an athlete in this and I've been in this and I've played basketball, I know it's going to be a good day because now I know they're not going to look at what they're trying to line up. They're going to look at the, the target coming across the middle or whatever it is. You know, a lot of folks will tell you uh, not only all those things you just said, but that also – 
uh, to to keep your mind off of the bead and the barrel and the and 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 the rib. Look at the beak of the bird, or look at the eye of the bird, or look at the yep. uh, the ring on the ring neck pheasant. Uh, is is that valuable, or do you have another way for us to focus on the target as opposed to the tool in our hands? No, that's absolutely. In fact, we have a um, we have a uh, saying on ring necks: it's belly beak boom. So basically, we're looking at the belly, we're moving the gun to the beak, and then we're stretching out in front and pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. So that is our mantra on big birds and 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 small birds too when they're we're in the crossing uh, stage. So it's mount to the belly, go to the beak, stretch in front, and pull the trigger. So it's belly beak boom. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know. It, it is easy when you do it and the person turns around and goes, holy cow, I just shot out into space, not at anything. I'm only looking at the target and the thing broke or the bird dropped. And, you know, I get these looks like, you know, they just gave birth um, when that happened. So it is kind of a pretty cool thing and it keeps us as instructors, you know, fresh because we see people smiling so much and when they do that. And when the dog brings it back and the, the dog sits, and they take it out of that dog's mouth, it's it's like Christmas every day. I'll take your word for it on that last part. I'm still working on it with Flick. But um, everybody out there, if you haven't watched that Wing Shooting USA episode from uh, Ravenwood Lodge for our Fur Feathers Friends Military Salute, yeah, Tom is the guy with the, with the two... Uh, two Britneys in the snow on the last segment of that show. And uh, you want to see some good dog work and some great shooting. That's where you're going to see it. It's up on YouTube. So you can always watch it there as well. Um, Tom, you, you alluded to something that was a, uh, it was a revelation to me. And this was many, many years ago and I still haven't mastered it, but this whole idea of uh, lead. And, and I know that's an intimidating subject. And I'm not going to ask you to teach us how to lead a bird, but is there anything that will help us visualize what you just described? And that is, we're, we see the bird, it's crossing hard left to right or right to left. We don't shoot where the bird is. We got to shoot ahead of the bird. I mean, how do you help somebody make that mental leap? Well, the, well, the first thing is they have to understand and they have to buy in that there is no space there per se, meaning that, I'm not going to ask them, were you two feet in front, three feet in front, one foot in front? It doesn't make a difference. What I'm asking them to do is match the speed of the bird with the gun, and then as soon as they see a space between bird and barrel, pull the trigger. We never ask them for how much. And the reason for that is we always let the speed of the gun determine the lead, meaning that if a bird is extremely slow, when we stretch in front of this bird, our gun's going to be extremely slow, thus less lead. If the bird is extremely fast, and now we're stretching in front of that bird, our gun's going at one mile an hour faster than the speed of that bird. Thus, there is your lead, not how much is my lead. Mm. So my mantra to my shooters and my people that I, that I teach is, when you see the space, pull the trigger. You're still looking at the bird, but humans have peripheral vision. We know where the space is. We know where the gun is. We know where all of that is. As soon as you see a space, pull the trigger. And that works 90% of the time. I'm being selfish here, but I'm hoping everybody else can appreciate the same thing that I'm looking for. And that is, all right, so our gun is moving at the same speed or slightly faster than the bird. Uh, is our gun in the ready position until that moment? Uh, when do we put the gun to our shoulder? Well, if we're going from a low gun position, if anybody has ever heard the terms from Lord Churchill, is move, mount, shoot. So basically, when that bird comes out of the grass, we're in a low gun position, but we're turning to keep that muzzle on that bird. As we turn the gun is coming up to our shoulder. And then as it comes to our shoulder and cheek, just about the time you get that gun on that cheek, you're ready to pull that trigger. Mm. So in, in many shooters and most of the people we get and most of the people we see, 
it's mount move shoot, not move mount shoot. If you mount first, the bird is now three, six, ten feet in front of that gun, and you're always playing catch up. So it's move to the bird, mount as you move. Once that gun gets to your cheek, you're almost ready to pull the trigger. All right. So if you were teaching me, you'd that'd be the first thing you'd end up fixing before we got to the important stuff. What about most? Uh, what about most of the other people out there? Is there a universal fault that most of us have? They pick the gun up first instead of mount, moving. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody wants to get that gun up because our brain says. It's getting away, it's getting away, it's getting away. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, pull the trigger. Yeah. Instead of, we have plenty of time. Here's the rationale. Gun, what's coming out of the end, 1,200 feet per second plus. Bird, coming off the grass, 30 miles an hour. So when you go to the, the equals, gun, 900 miles an hour coming out of the end. Bird. 40 miles an hour gun wins every single time you don't need to rush <laughs> that's pretty cut and dried tom and i appreciate that because i'm just a simple guy uh you know um you talk a lot about um uh what i'll loosely call performance and sports psychology and all of that um and then you talk about the mental training and and um kind of uh, 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 I'll call it, as you call it, awakening some of the some of our thinking process, maybe. But I, I would like you to elaborate on that a little bit when it comes to performance shooting, if you will. Well, performance shooting is like anything else in the universe. You have to now separate what you want to do from everything else in the universe. And I say to my my performance shooters, the guys who are shooting on a sporting clay circuit. I need 15 seconds four times or three times in that box of total unadulterated focus on what you're trying to do. Outside of that 15 seconds, I don't care what you do, but inside of that 15 seconds, I need total unadulterated focus. And, and very honestly, it's hard to do. It really is hard. We have so much going, going around in that computer of a brain of ours that it starts to get involved. So um, in our game, it's 15 seconds of toned, total unadulterated focus while you're in that box. After that, whatever is up to you. You know, and, you, and if you, make sense. you watch any kind of sporting event uh, and you'll see the athletes um, they, they all do it in a different way. So the pitchers will dig a hole in front of the mound. Batters will dig a hole in the batter, batting box. Football players will do something, whatever it is. But that's, that's how they're getting that focus straightened out, aren't they? Correct. And then, and again, everything starts that process. So when we're in the shooting box, I say it's a wall or a door. And once you step through that door into that box, the only thing you're thinking about is that process to break that clay. If you're outside that box, you can think of anything you want. But once you're in that box, everything starts. And with me, what I start my shooters on, as soon as two shells go in the gun and that gun is empty, the process begins. Just like a batter digging a hole, just like a batter the sign cross, whatever he does, he sets that focus in motion by a, by a physical action. And that's what we, I teach in the, the shooting box. Yeah, it's funny uh, how we all have our own little quirks when it comes to that stuff. But whatever works, works. Hey, more power yes. to you. Yes. Yep. Well, we're we're going to switch gears in the second half of our discussion, Tom. So uh, during this brief intermission, if you will start thinking about dogs and dog training and that sort of thing, we have a, a segment coming up next that I would like you to chime in on as well. So just hang loose for a moment, and then we will be back in our Handle It segment. So hold tight. This portion of the program is brought to you by... ESP America. You can learn all about their hearing protection options at ESPAmerica.com. One of the things I like most is the fact that 
all of their gear is custom fitted. Now, it doesn't cost you any more, and you can do it right in your own hometown in most cases. Go to one of their dealers and have it done. Then you'll be more inclined to use those hearing protection devices in the field because they will not fall out. They are comfortable, and they do the job. They'll block all the gunshots, but you'll still be able to hear your friend's bad jokes and your dog's collar tags as he's hopefully coming back on a retrieve. ESPAmerica.com And uh, once he does come back and you're packing him up for the drive home, you want to do that in a T Dakota 283 kennel. Dakota283.com is where you learn more about their line. All sorts of great products, shapes, sizes, and colors, and a bunch of accessories from gun storage to food and water carrying devices. It's all at Dakota283.com. Check out the stainless steel doors and locking mechanisms. Yeah, if you go out in harsh weather and who doesn't, that will come in real handy about the second season when you're trying to open the door. All right, you're back with the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, also the host of Wing Shooting USA, the TV show. Hope you'll watch it. Uh, lots of places to do that. Just go to scottlindenoutdoors.com and uh, you'll get the whole station list, times, days, and all, all that other stuff. With me on the program today, my friend Tom Fumarello. Tom is a shooting coach, uh, educator, a great hunter and dog handler, and Tom, I can't think of anybody better to talk about this with. Um, I had a revelation a while back, and I've been talking with a lot of folks on social media about what motivates a dog to perform better for us. And with your background in sports psychology and human performance, maybe some of it's transferable as well. Um, in the last couple, three weeks, I've had a lot of people talk about the primary motivator for a bird dog. And I, I, you know, I mentioned it in my book a couple of times. They're called bird dogs for a reason. They want to find birds. They want to hold birds. If they're lucky, they want to eat birds. Um, have you ever done anything in, in the world of, uh, you know, training with, uh, rather than food treats or praise or physical, uh, whatever you use, have you used birds as the reward before Tom? First of all, you can't make a bird dog without birds. The more birds you put that dog on, the more that dog is gonna to wanna to find birds. There is no substitute, there is no revelation, there is no trick, there is no tool. It's birds, birds, and more birds. And the more birds you put that dog on, the better that dog is going to be. And if anyone thinks these dogs don't learn, boy, they are sadly mistaken because these dogs learn and they learn in a heartbeat as long as you give them the avenue to learn. And that avenue is put them against the thing that they want to find. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I understand all of that completely. That's why I own pigeons and all of the headaches that come along with them. Um, let's take it to the next step. We got birds. We got a dog. The dog is working well on birds. I, I want to give you a perfect example. We were out at a training day last weekend, and uh, and one of the handlers has a young dog, and that dog, she's pretty steady on, on birds, and they'll fly the birds. Uh, the birds will get shot. The dog maintains a point, stays steady. The handler goes out, picks up the bird, brings it back, and then hands it to the dog. That rather than a liver treat or a pat on the head, that dog gets what it's living to get a bird in his mouth. Is that, have you ever worked in that area at all? Do you experiment with anything like that? Believe it or not, no. However, my question would be is uh, I think that's a great tool for the steady, and he's getting his reward of that bird. But to me, Getting that reward is that break to go get it and find it himself or herself. And, and um, you know, that's, I guess what they're doing is separating the retrieve from the steady, and that's fine. Um, but, boy, I sure like to see that dog bolt to that bird. And when that dog comes back with that bird, 
there's nothing like seeing him come back. So yeah. I haven't seen anything like that. That's new to me. Mm-hmm. But uh, for the steady work, seems like it's awful, awful pretty good. Yeah, I'm liking that a lot, um, and I've seen variations on that. And then ultimately, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, at some point, the dog maintains that steadiness. The bird gets shot. It hits the ground. The dog's still woed. Then the reward is the whole Megillah. Out and back, hold that thing as long as you want. In fact, give it to me, and then I'm going to give it back to you. And you can hold it. Just don't swallow it. Just don't run off and bury it. Just stay right here and hold it and savor it. And that's yeah, that. I'm I'm experimenting with all that, and I'm I'm liking the results so far. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a good thing. My only question would be, is is the dog now going to think? Well, I don't have to go get that bird. <laughs> I've got a I've got a human to go get it for me. That's pretty cool. I know. We've been trained by our dogs. Exactly. <laughs> I, hey, you know, I, I, I don't think that that I I I I hope no, nobody lets it get to that point because you're absolutely right that but you know retrieving training is an another kettle of fish absolutely absolutely and again some dogs it's it's no problem some dogs it's the worst thing you could ever go through <laughs> yeah yeah tell me about it I I'm playing with the um, you know we all talk about the the term force fetching. My, yep. Mine is the opposite. I, I'm going to call it gentle fetching. And so far with my pup, it's working pretty well. I won't bore anybody okay. with the details yet, but someday I'll write a blog post about it. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. real good. That's, yeah. That's, so, do it that way. My fingers are crossed and I'm knocking wood. So that's, yeah. keep me, I'll keep you posted. You know, so, um, so we're out in the field and our dog, um, maybe it's your dog, um, slams into a point. And we want to do what we've just talked about, make sure that that dog gets to carry that bird around for a while. So we want to kill it good stone dead right, the right way. Uh, dogs on point. Uh, well, let's not add grouse woods. We're in the prairie somewhere in South Dakota or North Dakota. How, Tom, how are we going to approach the dog and approach the bird so that we can do our best job of shooting? Well, we're going to... If I'm a guide on that situation, I'm going to give my, my hunters a little preview before they even step in the field, and that's how to approach the dog, how do I want to do things, how do I want to do it. Um, one, we want to make sure that that dog can see those hunters. We don't want hunters coming up directly in back of that dog. We want them out to the outside, so if the dog has to turn his head left and right, he can see those hunters that she can see those hunters. That gives that dog a real good idea of what, what's going to happen. We don't want the dog surprised, especially a young dog. We want this planned out. And one thing I, I always stress is pointing dogs are a wonderful situation for newbies and kids because behind a, punt, a hunting dog that is steady, a pointer, we can now map out this scenario to the nth degree, make it successful for both dog and hunter, and also make it safe for both dog and hunter. So um, if I digress a little bit on that, it's just to basically say that in that scenario, we can we can do that very, very well behind a, a steady pointing dog. But beyond that, um, I wanna make sure that dog can see both hunters. I want those hunters to be in front of the dog, not behind the dog. Everything we want to do, we want that dog to make sure that they know exactly what is going on and what's going on with those hunters. We want no surprises. The second thing is that, as a guide, I want to make sure those hunters are in front of both me and the dog. And if I am going to flush that dog for those hunters, I want to make sure that this scenario is as perfect as I can get it for them with their best chance of a quality shot. And if I've done my job in the pre, before we've even gotten and out in the field, they realize what their field of fire is. They realize that this is a game bird and it's going to do things that we don't expect. And they realize that they can't turn around left or right with a gun because they have people in back of them. And all that stuff is, is kind of pre-done. And me as a guide and the dog being as steady as she is, um, is going to predicate that and and make sure that's a real good situation. And we don't see it all the time, but for the most part, we try 
to make all those situations as as kind of played out as possible. I love the idea of, of just, uh, you know, not surprising a dog. Uh, they're, you know, they're creatures of habit. That's why they're called that. And uh, if everything they see is something they've already seen before, then obviously they're going to be more steady. And I think that's what you're really getting at there, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I mean, these dogs, these dogs know what's going on. Um, my two, three dogs, Ginger, Sugar, and Meg, if you combine them all three, they've probably had 10,000 birds over, over top of them in their life. So they know the drill. They know what's going on. When that drill is not the same, now something else could come into play, and we want to make sure that that something else um, is a safe situation as well as a productive situation for both uh, the person shooting and the dog that's retrieving. I mean, let's look at it as it's, it is not just both hunter taking game. It's a combination of the team being dog, hunter, man, everything. One of those things goes awry, then you've got an issue out there, either not taking game or something else. So we want to make sure the team is in, in as good a situation as it can possibly be. And that's why we buy pigeons all the time. You know, exactly. you. <laughs> You know, if you had a little bit of cake flour, you'd have the ingredients for a pretty good gingerbread um, of some sort with your dog names. And I, I just got to ask you where you where you come up with all of these great spice oriented names for your dogs, Tom. Well, again, again, we started with sugar a long time ago, 11 years ago, and she came from Kansas and she already had the name. And then we had a litter with sugar. And all the puppies were named after spices. And Meg is actually Nutmeg. Um, that's her, Meg is her short name. Um, and then my buddy had a litter. And I said to my wife, how about one more? And with that, you know, that look like, you got to be kidding me. She basically said, yeah, no problem. And we've got Ginger. And now with my litter that I just had, which we still have, um, I'm taking a pup from that litter, and she'll be named Cayenne, and her short name will be Annie. So we have the Spice Girls. A, and, a little uh, bit picante for that last one, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and they could probably sing as well as the original Spice Girls. Oh, well, depends on how I'm working them. But uh, <laughs> for, for the most part, they're definitely cuter. You um you put a bell on their collars all the time. I know you're a grouse hunter and a grouse guide as well and that sort of thing, but uh, you like the bell over a GPS collar? Well, I use a GPS collar when I'm in the grouse woods because, you know, my dogs don't run super big. Um, they're, all, they're all pretty tight running dogs. Um, 50 to 60 yards probably is a real max for them unless I let um, Meg or Ginger get out a little bit more based on what we're doing. Um, so in, in New York cover, especially in the, in the early part of the season, it's very difficult to know where these dogs are because the cover is so deep. So I like the bell because I can kind of figure out where they are, and when that bell stops, I know I've got a, I've got a dog on point. Um, I do use a GPS collar, and I think there's a place for it. But I do like the bell because I hear every time that dog makes a turn, I know exactly where she is. Um, and it just it gives me a little more um, safety in the field and a little more uh, knowing where those dogs are um, better than a GPS collar or better than a collar that beeps. Um, yeah. You know, they do make a collar that beeps too. And I, I use them, especially when they go on point. But the bell is the thing for me. Batteries never run out, and you don't have to look down at the screen to know where that dog is. Exactly. Exactly. I'm starting to work on that with my young dog, and the, and the first thing I figured out is he's going to have to learn uh, with a really quiet bell for a while because he is uh, he is totally confused about that noise coming off of his collar. Okay, well, you know what you can do is, Put a flank collar on him and put the bell back there. Hey, two birds, one dog. I get it. Yeah, because we're working now, on that now. 
So now, now he's got the belt coming from in back of him. He doesn't hear it as well. It's not kind of clanging in his, his face. And you can eventually, once he gets used to that, then move it forward. And I don't think you might have a have an issue. That's great. Thanks for the suggestion, Tom. Maybe the next time we hunt together, he'll be, he'll be, um, bell conditioned. There you go. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you, you taught physical education, you dealt with people of all ages, you're dealing with people of all ages now are, um, are humans like dogs in any respect that's relevant to uh, those of us who are in the shooting and hunting world? Well, I gotta be honest with you. I wish more humans were like my dogs. Um, they, they never have a bad day. They're always happy to see us. They forgive you for everything you do wrong, and as humans, we do a long and we do a lot wrong in the training field. Um, and and when you see these dogs, they think you're the best thing since socks. And here's the best thing: they treat everybody the same way. They don't care whether you're black, blue, silver, orange, have polka dots, or are a serial killer. They will treat you the same way until you treat them different. And I, I wish more humans have, uh, have, ha- have that attitude. And very honestly, you wrote your book that said what my dogs have taught me. And I got to be honest with you. My dogs have taught me to be a better person. Amen to and, that. And, and, that's, um, and that's serious and that's from the heart. My dogs have taught me to be a better person because when I look at some of the things they do with people, with other dogs, with that, I try and emulate how, how well they do it. So from that standpoint, um, you know, the book is right, number one. And number two, these dogs have taught me way more than I have taught them. That's uh, that's the bumper sticker. Uh, God uh, help me become the dog, the the person my dog thinks I am. Yep. Um, and you know it's funny. I just had a lesson in that last night. Uh, long story short, uh, you know you you put two or three dog people together, and uh, and most of the time they're going to get along pretty well, and they're going to they're they're just going to be more disposed to do wonderful things for each other. And somebody did me a solid yesterday. Frank, thank you so much. And thank your stepfather and your father and everybody else in that pigeon club for helping us out a little bit in our club. It was uh, one of those things that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a bunch of dog people coming together. And it, it, it's just wonderful how that can occur. Only because we've got this focus on something that's more wonderful, more marvelous, more everything than a bunch of humans sitting around drinking beer. And uh, here, here to that, because anybody who has not experienced, you know, a, a significant time with a quality dog has, has missed a big part of humanity. And, um, you know, there's a reason um, dog spelled backwards God. And, um, Honestly, I don't think I could ever live without one of them in front of me, greeting me when I come home, playing with me when I'm down, whatever. So let me tell you, there, there's something special. Well, that's, uh, that's why I opened my book with the, uh, what turns out to be ancient Roman graffiti. The more people I meet, the more I like my dogs. <laughs> that, that's, and nothing could be... Nothing could be more truthful. Nothing. All right. We're getting towards the end of uh, our discussion, Tom. Uh, by the way, everybody, if you want to learn more about what Tom does and what he can do for you, he's up in New York uh, teaching shooting at the St. Hubert's Club. Uh, by the way, thank you uh, because I learned a lot more about St. Hubert's since I started uh, digging up that information on you. He also does some guiding. He does a lot of speaking, and hopefully we'll run into each other at Pheasant Fest this year, and maybe we'll both be speaking again. But anyway, um, XL, let's see, where are we? I, uh, tell me again. Well, there it is, xlsportingclayinstruction.com, and that's XL, letter X, C-E-L, Sporting Clay Instruction. Right, Tom? That's it. 
Learn that, more that's there. Got... That's great. And uh, if you wanted to leave us with one last bit, whether it's a shooting tip or a dog tip or a hunting a bit of hunting advice, uh, let's go out on a high note. Tell us something that we uh, we probably need to do more of. Well, if if anything, forget about dogs. Forget about world. Treat take somebody out hunting. Take somebody out shooting. Take somebody to experience your dogs. Take somebody out to experience something that you have a passion for because we always need one more of them. So that would be my, my one thing, whether it be a child, a veteran, uh, a friend, someone who's never had a firearm in his hand and now takes them to a different thought process about what we do and how we do it. So. Get somebody out there who's never done it, whether it be on the clays range, skeet range, trap, out in a field. Take a woman hunting who has never experienced what our dogs do and how they do it. Um, take somebody out doing something new that they've never done and experience what we do every day and how much we love what we do. And if you show them the passion for what you have to get them out there to do it, well, then maybe we'll create one more different attitude, one more different convert to the sport. One person who now has a different thought process on what they have now versus what it really is. And that would be the only thing I could say. That is a uh, words. Th those are words to live by Tom Fumarello. Thanks for bring, bringing yourself and all of your wisdom to our Upland nation podcast. Uh, have a great evening and we'll see you in the field. I am just confident. I will see you very soon, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott, very much. And uh, everybody have a great evening. Great guy, great information. We'll be spending time in the field. Believe me, Tom, I'll see you soon. So coming right up is our This Land is Your Land public access section of the program. In the meanwhile, take a look at the dogter.com website and toggle on down, so to speak, to their TNB dual two-dog system. It's a little different than everybody else's two-dog system in that you don't have to toggle back and forth on the handheld part of the system to deal with one dog versus the other. It's all right there. One hand, two sets of buttons. So you always know which dog you're working on, depending on which fingers you use on which set of buttons. Simple, easy, convenient. Why didn't somebody think of that sooner? Take a look at the entire Dogtra catalog. And remember two things, free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks. And on any purchase over 200 bucks, mention the coupon code SLUN10 and take another 10% off your purchase. It's all at dogtra.com. In Texas of all places, yeah, there is free publicly accessible quail hunting in Texas. Not as much as in some states, but it's Texas, and that means the quail population might be pretty strong in any given year. Try out the Lake Meredith National Recreation Area. It's out there in the panhandle, so take out your uh, map and take a look and then start planning your trip. The Corps of Engineers handles that whole area, and they'll be helpful to you in many ways. First off, because they manage the water, so you don't want to go quail hunting in flooded areas. They'll also have somebody on staff who might have seen a covey here or a covey there, and uh, then it's up to you to get out and uh, use some of that boot leather in a profitable way. Stay away during the deer season at the Lake Meredith National Recreation Area because it's awfully crowded. It is open to the public. It's only about 60 miles north of Mamarillo, and it's one place you won't have to spend 10000 bucks for a quail lease. See you out there. All right, we're coming up on the Upland Trivia Quiz, and... Uh, just wrapping things up, but before we do, I want to thank our newest sponsor, Tag Safari. That's T A G Safari dot com. These folks are doing something a little bit cool in any number of regards. They're growing crops 
they are harvesting crops, and they are making the packaging for a lot of their products right there in Africa with local help. Now talk about a dual-purpose company. Tag Safari has got it covered. If you love great wardrobe accoutrement or accessories of various sorts from, well, uh, home goods to books to anything that would have to do with your Africa trip, or if you just want to look cool at your next Safari Club meeting, tagsafari.com is where you go. Their clothing is incredibly made and just wears better over time. It's all at tagsafari.com. Find out more about them and tell them I sent you. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, it is trivia time. This week's question, on a dog, where would you find the carpal pad? Well, congratulations, Brittany Lowry. You have the correct answer. You tell us it is located on the dog's front forelimbs around the wrist area. That's correct. In fact, just for clarity, I'll tell you it's in the kind of the backside, uh, the inboard backside of the dog's leg. Brittany says they're also called the stopper pads. I get that. And she also says that's why they aid in traction. Uh, never knew that one before. Brittany, you're going to get a Yeti Rambler 10 wine tumbler for your correct answer. Check out the questions at our Facebook page. And then, of course, send your answers to me at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. That's the right place for the answers. That way, if you have the right one, you are um, not giving everybody else the answer, too. All right. Well, that'll put a capper on it for this time. Tom Fumarello, thank you so much. It's great to talk with you again. Whether it's on the phone or in the field, sure enjoy learning from you every time we talk. Those of you out there, I hope you learned something as well. And if you'd like to learn more, of course, subscribe to the Upland Nation podcast because there's much more in store. Check out all of the back log of podcasts out there all sorts of great information i hope you will tell your friends and subscribe until the next time we get together i'll see you at uplandnation.com or at the upland nation facebook page tell your friends tell your enemies tell your dogs thanks for listening i'm scott linden your host <laughs>